we are here to talk about the Lemonscape. Um, it is an interactive programmable sculpture uh, by, by myself and mm -hmm. Ann Johnson. Uh, I'm Charles Comstock. Um, and we have on the right a picture of it from last year at Stranger 2022. Um, the upper section is the actual physical sculpture with the lights, and the, the lower section is the kiosk, which is running off of a Raspberry Pi 400. Um, okay, so we're going to talk, we're going to do a little discussion about the concept of uh, how we conceived of this the piece. Um, then we're going to talk about some components of the sculpture and some of the software architecture that goes into it. Then we're going to talk about how to program patterns for the sculpture. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about musical input through MIDI um, and, and how that is now a new external input that you can uh, provide to, to adjust the patterns that show up on the sculpture this year. Um, then we're going to give some concluding thoughts and Onward, onward to questions and answers, and hopefully, hopefully we've got some time for for that as well. So, all right, uh, backgrounds. Sure. Okay. So, um, for myself, I am an electrical engineer in training in the state of Missouri, and I graduated with my bachelor's in electrical engineering last year in May. Um, I work full time as a lighting designer for an engineering firm in St. Louis, and. In my free time, I create light-based artworks. I work in LED and neon very often. Um, and I actually returned to school to study electrical engineering after many years um, tinkering with electronics in my attempts to create sculptures. So I have a lot of love for makers, DIY, DIYers, and luminant objects in general. Uh, this video that's on the slide is a most recent piece of mine, and here you can see some of my trademarks, which are combining neon, um, LED matrices, a lot of different light elements, and then also working with some sign making techniques. So, so um, I'm Charles Comstock. Um, my background is in computer science. Um, I worked as a software engineer for many years, and then late, uh, I have been dabbling more in some generative digital art and playing around with what weird things I can get, P5JS and Quill and Closure Script and various things that I'll put together pretty pictures on the screen. Um, I also did some photography in the past. Um, and uh, that's 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 kind of a snapshot images versus uh, building up images is, is kind of been a transition that uh, I've been taking my art through. So um, all right, onward to the concept. Sure. The concept of this sign came about um, as a way of uh, activating the logo of the Strangers Conference and uh, really just exploring different ways that we could collaboratively iterate together on an art piece. Um, with my background in art, I had discussed with Bridget some of the art that I do, and it just sort of arose naturally from that that they wanted us to give, us a, give this a shot. I reached out to Charles to get involved because he has a really much deeper depth of understanding of programming and has a lot more experience with that. And together we've been able to really build this like robust experience that people can interact with. Um, so that was last year we brought the, the sculpture and had the interactive code portal. And then this year um, we did wanna add another interface for interaction and I was drawn to using MIDI specifically through my other uh, experiences in doing interactive media installations. MIDI really is this universal language that, despite being invented over 30 years ago, um, is still ubiquitous. And uh, that sort of longevity, I think, is really impressive and also really opens up the sculpture for a lot of different types of interaction. So we decided to go with MIDI so we could have a live control element rather than relying only on loop-based loop programming. Yeah. Just as a slight aside, we took it um, to Artica, which is a local festival here um, last fall. And like, so whereas Strange Loop, like it's wonderful for folks with code background because they, they can explore it through that. Mm -hmm. right? Like it, it was really apparent that also having a tactile component really added to the piece by by opening up the doors to both those that can code and also those that can our interest in music and, and, and other forms of expression. So, um, so, so um, the other thing I, I like 
you know, we, we set it up to be the shape of the strange loop logo, but I also like Christopher Puny is like a really fancy graphing calculator. <laughs> like that's that's the best framing of this device. <laughs> this like beautiful, glowy graphing calculator. So, yes. Oh, and the name, yeah. the name comes from the yeah, the lemon, lemon yeah, the lemon scape of Bernoulli, yeah. which is the, the actual equation that represents the, the strange loop logo and, and the infinity sign and um, yeah, there's there's a couple other lemon skates, but this is this is the one that was closest matching for the logo. So, cool. all right. So, some discussion on the system architecture. So, if a person that attends the conference or comes up to the sculpture that's user, they can interact with the MIDI instruments that are besides the the, the kiosk. So, the kiosk is a little computer below the the, below the sculpture. Um, the kiosk just runs a browser. Uh, the the user can upload new program, you know, write programs in that kiosk, um, or separately if they run, they use the kiosk on online. But if they're at the at the sculpture, then they use it through the the kiosk there. Um, and when they push keys on the MIDI instrument, then it pushes that pushes those events forward through the browser using the Web MIDI um, protocol and sends those relays those on to the microcontroller firmware. Uh, the microcontroller is responsible for rendering every single uh, frame of animation. So it, it converts the web assembly that is generated by the compiler in the little browser kiosk. It converts it into actual pixel values and, and shoves that over to the sculpture LEDs. When we receive MIDI inputs, then those come across as, as just events. And then the microcontroller uh, receives those events and updates places in memory corresponding to um, the value sent over by the events, and, that, and then that updates the next frame for animation. So um, this is kind of rough, but like it gives you a rough flow of, of how information propagates through the system. So, um, so the browser kiosk. This is this is the same application that's hosted on GitHub. The link there is on the right, uh, lower lower right. Um, so it is an integrated development environment that we designed for the sculpture. Uh, it's written in Clojure Script. It contains a whole host of different features, but but fundamentally, fundamentally, what it does is it takes this little vector programming language that we designed um, and converts it into WebAssembly and then that bytecode. And then, if once you're actually attached to the sculpture, then you can upload those bytecode outputs to the sculpture and and render the animation that you wrote in the browser on the actual sculpture itself. We also relay all the MIDI events as I was discussing in the last slide. Um, uh, and, and critically, so when, when you're at the sculpture, this website is actually hosted on the Wi-Fi of the sculpture um, versus when you go to the GitHub version, then that's the, that's the same application. It's just hosted on GitHub. So you can use it wherever you want, but it, it's not backed by any backend server versus when you're actually at the sculpture, then it's backed by the, the firmware on the on the MIDI, ah, sorry, microcontroller. So. so basically, you have to be on the sculpture's Wi-Fi to upload to it. Yes. 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 So, and that that's these extra little features that are not visible on, on the GitHub version. You can see there's a send to sculpture as, and that allows you to name your um, piece on the sculpture, and that'll enter into the rotation. Like, you immediately transition and schedule that new piece on the sculpture. And then uh, it, once it's been uploaded, then it enters the rotation. So periodically, I think it's set at the conference, we'll set it back to like every minute or every two minutes. It'll reschedule any of the existing sketches that people have uploaded. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, the, the actual browser kiosk is running, I think I mentioned this before, it's been running on a Raspberry Pi 400. It's a little single board version of the Raspberry Pi, except it has a keyboard. Um, so it's, I don't know, I, I originally learned to program on a Commodore 128 and 64, and it's kind of the same form factor. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice throwback to that. So, um, but the main thing about this page is it's simulating what will happen on the sculpture. And so you can use it to create your patterns. So. We're going to talk about the microcontroller a little bit. So the microcontroller that's running all this is in the ESP32. Uh, that's uh, it's a little dual core 240 megahertz microcontroller. 
320 KB of RAM, four megs of flash. It's got integrated Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. They're they're cheap. They're like seven dollars a pop. Like you can throw them into any little project that you want, but they're they're really pretty cool. Um, so uh, also, I, mean, I I can't think of the use case of the, the, the their temperature range is something like negative forty to one hundred and ten Celsius or one hundred and five Celsius, I think. So I, I don't I don't think you could put it in space because of uh, radiation, but they're they're still pretty cool. So um, it hosts the actual web application, uh, and then it also runs a WebAssembly interpreter called WASM3. Um, so it takes the bytecode that we uploaded from the web page and runs that to generate each frame of animation. Um, as mentioned before, those programs are also stored in the flash memory on the device, so we can schedule them again. Uh, and then it also retransmits the, the mini messages and updates the, the memory map for the WebAssembly interpreter. Uh, so oh, physical sculpture. I'm going to talk yeah. a little bit about the physical sculpture itself. Um, this was created to break apart easily. And so come, come together and break apart uh, as close to painlessly as possible uh, to make that easy for transportation. Um, we decided on this specific size for the sculpture because it is the way to maximize the five meter long pixel strips that make up the loops on the inside. Um, so like I said, I've been working a little bit in sign making techniques and I drew from that inspiration to come up with this form for the, sh for the sculpture. It's made out of frosted acrylic on the front and a the body is made out of aluminum. Um, it has a plywood CNC backing and uh, just breaks apart, comes together at the seam in the middle. So. Um, yep. Okay, so let's take a look at how to actually program new animation patterns for the sculpture. Uh, so the language that we're using to program patterns is a vector programming language. Um, so vector programming languages are a solution for, for problems that involve a fair amount of parallelism, um, example being writing out all the pixels on your display on your computer. Um, like early examples of vector languages is APL that's, I think, mid 70s or something like that. But the most common place that you run into vector languages these days is in graphics card shaders. So you've got you know, a giant 2D array of all the pixels on your, on your screen, and you farm out the rendering of every single pixel on the screen to a, a whole host of shaders. Um, for our purposes, we're not actually parallelizing anything, but we are using that model. Um, and the fundamental model for vector languages that I think kind of differentiates it from more imperative or functional style is it's we don't call us, we'll call you. So in a, for our particular approach here, like the pixel color function is what the user is entering in that little text box that we showed on the kiosk page. So that is the function that you're defining. And then this loop just happens invisibly. Like you don't you don't see it, but that's that's what is being evaluated to generate the pixel for every index of the, sorry, that is the expression that is being evaluated for every index of the vector. So, um, so, and and this al allows us to do certain tricks, like we can do uh, interlacing if we want to increase the frame rate. So we don't necessarily need to call the update on every single frame update. We can flip flop between frames, um, but. The user provides the pixel color function, and then the microcontroller and the browser and everything else is responsible for actually figuring out how to render that. Um, so this language that we used, that, you know, it's, it's unique to this sculpture, but it is uh, loosely inspired by the, the Tixi language, which was time index x and y coordinates. Um, and I don't actually know who created it. Like their website is just kind of blank page, but it's it's neat and it's, it's worth taking a look at. Um, and was definitely a big inspiration for for the language here. Um, so some basics on the language. Uh, again, we want to calculate the color of each pixel at index i for a given time t. So uh, because as as we saw on the previous slide, this pixel color only accepts that index and the time value. Um, 
So uh, for the square brackets, what we're doing is we're just emitting like a hue, saturation, and luminance value for each pixel. Um, we chose hue, saturation, and luminance as the, as the default output because that allows you to do nice, uh, smooth color transitions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the color modes in, in the coming slides. Um, but under the hood, this is still being output as the underlying red, green, and blue intensities that are being output to every single uh, three prong LED on the actual sculpture. Um, you know, because when you have a color LED, which you, you don't actually have a value for each color, you have an, a red pixel LED, a green pixel LED, and a blue pixel LED, and they're all just sitting right next to each other on a tiny little package. And so um, that's that's literally the intensities that we're we're putting out, and those are mixed together into a color that is discernible to the eye at a distance. Um, the language only supports for external inputs. Like we only we support time in milliseconds. Um, I think that's system time. It's not like times from the start of the sketch. But uh, and then what we've added this year is we now support um, some some MIDI events, and we'll, we'll get to that as as we move forward in the presentation. Um, uh, deeper dive onto the color modes. Um, uh, so the HSL is hue, saturation, and lumens. Hue is your position around the color wheel. Um, so it's you know zero to three hundred sixty degrees, or in our case, we're mapping from zero to two five five. Um, saturation value is the, the sort of distance from gray. It's like how pure the color is. Um, and, and then actually, when you think about that in the underlying pixels, that's that's how much of just red or how much of just green or how much of just blue versus if you want a grayscale value, then you have all those intensities be equal. Um, and uh, and then luminance is sort of like you're on, it's a dimmer switch. It's your, your, your total emission of light, you're, you're on off. Um, so, uh, and then so proportional HSL is sort of this, this weird mode that we invented to, to make things look nice for the sign, which is that, and, and I'm gonna, there's a better graph of this in I think the next slide, but um, the, the problem is, is that each pixel, there's two loops in the sign, right? Like it's, it's two lemon skates that are offset by 0.1 meters. And so if you want to have the colors on the inside and outside loop match, then you need to remap your index, not in relation to the total number of pixels available, but just in terms of the pixels on one particular loop. And then you want to make sure those two values are the same so that you get you know, red on the inside and red on the outside at the same position. Um, so, um, all right. So kind of blow through this slide because there's a, there's a better slide showing this later, but we support for each pixel, uh, we support the, sorry, for each, value of the expression, we export the X and Y coordinate of that particular pixel that you want to evaluate. The uh, radius represented as R and the uh, theta or heading, which are the polar coordinates. Um, and then we expose a number of constants, like N being the number of pixels, L being the number of pixels in one loop. That's for that proportionality we were talking about, um, or uh, width and height. Um, and, and width and height, they're really useful if you want to remap from having uh, you know, the, the exact X location to the Y location, if you want to have the proportion of how, what percentage from the left to the right you are, then you, you would do like a, a float X divided by width, and then you, you know where you were in the space. Um, this will be a little clearer on the next slide. So this, this little coordinate slide kind of gives you an idea where, where everything is. So we've got our uh, X and Y coordinates of zero, zero, the origin is in the upper left, you know, y descends downward from there, x goes from left to right, ascending. Um, and uh, we have the radial distance from the center, that's this, this r component. And then we have the rotational position around the center origin, not the zero, zero origin, but the, the actual center of the sculpture. That's what the, the r and theta are, are in, in reference to. Uh, and then finally, we have the, the index zero, which is the inner right red loop that's transitioning into yellow and that continues on through green and then transitions to blue. And then when I equals L, that's the discontinuity where we're jumping from the, the first loop of the sculpture to the second loop of the sculpture. 
Um, and then we continue along from blue into purple and then back to red. And then we arrive at I equals M, which is the total number of pixels, which is 581. Um, and the, the, the program below, um, this HSL flow to I divided by N times 255, that's just remapping the index to be proportional to the total number of pixels. Um, if we didn't, if we just put a float of I, then then red would loop more than once because uh, you know we we only map from zero to two five five for for each color value. So we need to remap that into this reduced space and then expand it back out to the the space available. Um, and we'll we'll see that again when we actually look at the the control interface. Um, okay, so we expose a few functions. Your basic arithmetic both for floating point and integer. Uh, we support some limited automatic type coercion. Um, we also support like forced type casting between integer and float. Um, if if you've got a sketch where you're quantizing things too much, like the, the, the values jump considerably, often it's useful to recast it into float. So it's, it, it'll smoothly transition as opposed to kind of jumping between each integer. Um, then we also expose some basic Math functions like absolute value, ceiling floor, rounding, um, modulus, you know, so that you can constrain it to a certain thing and it'll loop back over. It also uh, expose square and square root. Um, and we got the trigonomic uh, functions, sine, cosine, and tangent. And then we have a couple conditionals. The so language does not support um, like an if conditional, but it does support um, conditionals in the sense that you can you can feed it a clamp function. So you say, I want to make sure that the value is between a lower and upper bound. And if it falls below the lower bound, then we just want to get the lower bound. If it falls above the upper bound, then we want to take the upper bound. Um, for a step function, that's like, if the threshold is below the value, then we do zero, above, and then one. Smooth step is similar to the step, except that we got a lower and upper bound, but we do a smoothing curve. So it's a continuous function instead of a discontinuity of turning directly from off to on. Um, and then mix is a is like a linear interpolation. So that lets you have uh, an A value and a B value, and then some parameter T that's a position in between. And so if T is zero, then you will get A. And if T is one, then you'll get B. So you can combine a mix and a step to kind of say, all right, when we're below a threshold, then we want T to be zero, which makes it the, the value A. Um, and there's actually compiler support in there where to optimize it because uh, you know, it, it evaluates all sides of the tree, but it 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 doesn't need to evaluate both the A and B in that step condition example. So there's some little optimizations that, that it takes care of to, to speed things up. Um, uh, all this is documented on the kiosk software and in a couple different places there. So all there's far more details there, and me going over it here is probably not the the best use of the time, but uh, feel free to, to peruse that at, at a later date. So, um, all right, some new features that we've added this year is that we now also support some variables in language. So the variables, it's just a let statement with the name of a variable and then expression, and then that gets plugged into the color statement afterwards. Um, so in this particular example, I'm constructing two fake low frequency oscillators at different rates and using that to modulate the R and um, a modulus of the radius as well. And then also adding in a time component. Uh, and we'll, we'll show this example on the sculpture in, in a little bit. Um, you can also add comments. Um, and yeah, again, there's there's language reference all over the site um, that, that goes into much more depth than each each function is explained um, carefully. So um, so let's let's see some some demos. So, so this is this proportional example where we have the red and the blue mapping into the same locations. Um, we can easily adjust things. So we use, let's say we want radial distance from the center. So we get this expansion patterns. Um, if we want to smooth out that rate and, and slow it over a, a wider range, then we, we can divide it. You know, if we want it sharper and to change more often, then we can multiply. Um, if we want to slow down the whole animation, then we can divide by a larger constant, uh, divide time by a larger constant. Um, and you know, all, all this works for the X and the Y or the heading. You know, we got these these color sweeps as we, we move around the space. 
um, discontinuity where we transition from 360 to zero. Um, the interface has some debugging affordances, so you can you can pause the animation. Here, I'm going to switch it back. Yeah. Also, there's there's all these examples. I, I know I most of the way I learned a program, and most of the, when I learned a new programming language, is I like, look at countless examples, and so we do in fact have countless examples for you to to, to peruse at your own leisure. Um, but you know, for um, this color chase example, if we pause it, we can jump around in time and, and see what it would be at different t values. Um, and then we can switch back to running. Um, this uh, sent to sculpture as, again, this is only available when we're connected to the sculpture, which is this, this is currently connected to it. Um, and that allows you to name a sketch and send it to the sculpture. Um, I talked a couple of times, I mentioned the language guide. There's both language guide here. And then most of the content is also available under the help. Um, though it's split out into you know subsets and and not like a huge information dump. Uh, but over here, it's nice because you can still see the animation and you can still read the docs at the same time. But uh, it's it's probably a little easier to read under the help menu. Um, so uh, and then I'm not going to dive too deep into the WebAssembly section, um, but we do have a full model of how. This is modeling what's actually happening on the sculpture. So this is running on the right. We're seeing the memory map of a limited version of the sculpture. So just a 31 pixel version of the sculpture. Um, and we're seeing that this initial section is showing like the constants that are baked into the WebAssembly image. This, this is just literally the memory of the WebAssembly uh, binary. Um, we can see the actual contents of the WebAssembly binary over here. That's not very useful, but it's, it's there if you want it. Um, uh, and so if you scan through the, the hex display here, you, this, this section I think is where it's representing the X and Y and R and theta coordinates for each pixel. And then um, there's a section here that's empty that we'll, we'll talk about. That's, that's actually where the amplitude is being stored, um, which is how we're receiving key information into the sculpture. We'll talk about that for, for many. And then you know we have this nice little matrix-esque view of these color values being re-represented in the decoded results. Um, and on the left, we've got this, uh, it, it, this is this various steps through the comp compilation process. So you can see where it's doing type annotation. And if there's if there's some confusing value, you're like, why is it you know mixing these values and the, the type conversion doesn't work out, you can you can actually inspect and, and see how those are applied. Um, uh, very happy to talk about that in more details. That's not to focus here though. So uh, back to the exhibit. So let's let's cut to the the actual screen for a second. So it's the lemon skate in the background for a second. And let's first do color chase example. Yep. So we've got color chasing happen, or we can do, or is that that LFO example, I think is this one. So Send that over, and now we've got these kind of little pulses. And so the the fast pulses that we're getting, are, I think, are from the LFOB. That's the the modulate the modulation on the radial distance modulate in mod thirty two versus the LFOA, which is running uh, just a little bit slower. But that's that's sort of the, your radial distance from the center. Um, so there's, there's lots of different ways that you can express yourself using the the, the constraints of this language. Um, and it's uh, look forward to seeing what all you you can create with it. So, all right. Okay, so uh, you may be asking why specifically MIDI, and I did brush on this a little bit um, earlier by noting its ubiquity, but I wanted to dive a little bit further into that because it is why I chose this specific um, protocol to incorporate in this. Uh, I think that MIDI is one of the first examples of a truly open source technology. Um, and for that reason, it's interesting and ties in with the purpose of this conference. Um, in the 80s, as musical synthesizers were becoming to be manufactured uh, as an industry, they were running into a lot of issues with um, inter be being able to be compatible with each other because different synthesizer manufacturers were using their own standards and solving uh, communication issues their own way, often synthesizers were not able to communicate. And so the head of the Roland Corporation 
saw that this was going to be an issue within the industry and decided that it would be in the best interest of everyone in the industry if they created a standard that everyone could use so that that way everyone was kind of speaking a common language. So in 1981, he reached out to uh, the Oberheim, uh, the head of the Oberheim uh, company, who was another synthesizer manufacturer who had created a competing um, data transfer protocol and started talks about, you know, I think we should develop a protocol that we all use in common. So a couple, so strategically, they decided that they should create a protocol that's inexpensive to implement so that manufacturers wouldn't have to invest a lot to enact it in their own products. And then they made it so that the protocol itself would be free to use. And in that way, by making it inexpensive to implement and free to use, so no license required, um, the MIDI protocol became standard throughout the music industry and is still everywhere today. Um, so I just thought that was a really interesting piece of history and probably has some lessons about why and how certain open source technologies become successful and ubiquitous. Um, so the picture on the left here is a five pin data cable. So that is what a MIDI uh, data cable looks like. Nowadays, pretty much all instruments communicate over MIDI to USB, um, but our sculpture will accommodate five pin MIDI cables. If you have instruments that only have those as a port, we do have adapters. Um, and then we have some pictures of very common MIDI controllers. So you can have something like the Akai, which is just a really nice mappable uh, control board to a something like the Arturia there, which is, again, gives you a lot of different controls that can be mapped to anything. You also see a lot of MIDI drum machines and sequencers. Uh, so next slide. Cool. So as far as uh, how the MIDI protocol works, um, whenever a MIDI event happens, a packet is sent and these packets contain information uh, pertaining to what the message is um, and then the data contained within the message. So for control change messages um, in a MIDI system, you can have 128 controls and each of those controls can be mapped to 0 to 127, so 128 different steps of value. So often you see this as a knob, a slider, or a touch strip. So those usually have a resolution of 128. Um, we, for our sculpture, we're, even though for a typical MIDI controller, you would have zero to 127 control change uh, channels, we were remapping everything to four ports, so zero to three. Um, an example of one control change uh, type of message would be the pitch bend. So that's a special type of MIDI message where you're able to take uh, a, a note that's already on and then kind of vibrato up and down um, to a resolution of over 8,000 up and down either way. Um, so I've been working a little bit on a controller that takes advantage of this in a creative way and hopefully I'll have that to show off. Um, but the, the workhorse MIDI messages that I've been working with have been the note on and note off messages. So you basically specify this is a note on message, you give it the note, and then you specify the velocity of the note, which is the protocol's way of trying to translate how hard a musician is playing something. So like, um, I guess something that to me makes MIDI really interesting is it's an attempt to translate a live performance into a, a digital representation. So uh, thinking about velocity, that would be like, how hard are you pressing this piano key? Um, so with a note on message, you can specify again, the note that the note's on, what note it is, and then how hard it's being played. Um, so that's okay. it. Cool. All right, so let's uh, take a look at how some of those work on this culture. I'm not brief, like there's, there's a lot of code on this slide. We're, we're gonna look at the exact examples on this culture in a second. But I just wanted to reiterate. So you know, we we, we remap to ports zero to three just so that um, you know we're trying to accept any MIDI instrument being plugged in, and so we don't want to have to 
figure out you know what what things all map on a particular device. We just want to remap them all into this small subset so that any knobs or dials that you have on your device will 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 be applicable. Yeah. So um, so we're going to show the control example. Then we're going to show a, a pitch example. We're going we're going to adjust the heading so the color is going to swipe based on the the pitch. Then we're going to do um, an amplitude example. Um, so amplitude is something that we we kind of developed. We we wanted to allow the sculpture to represent um, the effect of pressing down a chord, so pressing down multiple keys. Um, and so in in sound, that's that's you know Fourier transforms and, and various coefficients and, and difficult uh, to to represent uh, easily. In particular, it's like a it's like a lot of continuous values. Um, so in order to sort of drop that into something that we could use on the sculpture. What we do is when you hit a note, um, you have a velocity and that velocity is from zero to 127. So we double that and we set that in an amplitude array and we drop that into the memory map of the, the web assembly. And so, and then we do like a, a windowed five, uh, uh, sorry, a, win a Gaussian convolution of width five over the particular values at each position. So that's that's like an averaging or a, um, a window operation that, that smooths and allows hitting a note at a specific location to blossom over the surrounding area. So it's not it's not actually what notes or, or values would do on, an, on a real instrument exactly, but it allows you to get that same expression of hitting a chord and having it affect the sculpture in an interesting way. Um, we do also support as input the last note and last velocity last velocity function and that's just purely the the exact note value from 0 to 127 that you last pressed and the last velocity of that press if you if you press several notes and then you release one of them it will revert back to the note and velocity of the, the previous but it's it, it the sketches that use that will jump around a lot and we'll see that in a second so let's take a look at the sculpture again so let's look at um the where is this yeah. So this is an example using the control values. So if we look at the actual sculpture, when I slide these, we're module we're adjusting the X offset. So we're moving the, the section that is red because that's in the red component of the, the output. Um, then I'm gonna adjust the second slider and we're getting Y component. And this is this is both like I'm adjusting a slider on the external device. Um, but you can also do that in the web interface. Um, and and then finally the, this is adjusting the amount of blue as a as related to the radial distance from the center. So um, so that's that's an example using the control values. Again we're just using 0, 1, 2, 1 and 2 here. We do offer that's not used by that sketch, um, but it, it is available. Um, let's take a look at an example using amplitude. Um, so this one is actually using both amplitude and um, the slider. So if I press a key on the keyboard, then we will see blossoming in a, in a corresponding region on the, on the sculpture. And then if I adjust the slider, and you can swipe that color and move it across it. Um, you know, if I hit if I hit two keys, then we'll see multiple regions blossom. Um, and this this graph down below that is that is the amplitude graph that that is being reprojected onto the screen. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know if that's visible, but that's on the that's on um, the presentation section, but not on the on the actual sculpture. Um, so yeah, that's 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 this amplitude effect where it, we get this these nice blossoming colors at various locations on the sculpture. And, and again, because, because we have this little programming language that you can map that however you want, you can, you can readjust how that amplitude affects the particular sketch that you're making. So it's a, it's a nice new uh, input. Um, uh, and then let's do orientation. Oh no, there's a, there's a simpler version. Uh, there is a uh, kitchen heading, yeah. So this is the example that was on the slide. So this, this example, I'm now going to adjust the, the pitch. And so we're getting color swipes as we as we move, as I move my picture, finger up and down the pitch slider. Um, but um, likewise, if I if I move the slider, then, then it has the same effect. 
Um, so, um, and then let's go to the last note example. And this this one is a little more jumpy as, oops, yep, there we go. Uh, this is a little more jumpy. So depending on how hard you hit, you do adjust both the color and here I'm gonna softly hit it. So we don't, we only impact the center versus if I hit it hard then it's impacting further out. Um, this one, it, the last note and last velocity is a little harder to, to map into something interesting, but it, it's, it's a good challenge. So, and all, all this is also working with the, the keyboard below. So you don't need to have a MIDI instrument attached. You can, you can use this internet interface to, to test it. Um, so, oh, uh, and Anne's going to talk in a second about making your own MIDI devices, but we do support um, some debugging assistance there with that, which is that we log all the messages coming in. So when I press um, keys, then we can see these note on and note off messages, and then the channel they're coming in, and then the velocity, and, and I'm sorry, the note, and then the velocity. And, and likewise for control values, which will just you know flood the console with output, um, but all, all that's available if you, if you toggle this little button, so. I wanted to, as part of my, uh participation this year, encourage everyone coming to the conference to take this as an opportunity to build your own MIDI instrument, dust off your Arduino, get it fired up, try to <laughs> try to write a sketch where you're outputting a MIDI message, um, bring it to the conference, and we'll hook it into the sculpture and see what happens. Um, so I am working on a MIDI controller myself. I'm using an Arduino Leonardo, um, and I'm using a really well-supported library from the Arduino group, which is at the link provided there, midiusb.h. Um, so it's really simple to work with. Um, I included this example function of a note on message, and even just reading through here, I'm sure you can see where you can switch out these variables of channel pitch and velocity. Um, and really open up a lot of opportunities. So I have here this very simple pressure sensor uh, sketch that I've been working on. Um, and the serial monitor is outputting the reading from a variable pressure sensor. So as pressure increases, the resistance changes. And in this serial monitor, you can see a really simple sketch that I've written um, where it is sending many notes on or off based on the reading. So hopefully that opens up some ideas. There's a lot you can do really. Um, and as we can see here on the log page, you can go into here and see that we've got, it's recognizing this MIDI uh, Arduino Leonardo input. Now, as a note, if you're debugging with this, for it to log to the console, you do have to come to the editor and check this before it will start um reading so just make sure you do that and as you can see here here here's some of it popping up but again hopefully that opens up some ideas and uh gets them flowing i'm also working on something with an accelerometer that i'm holding together so that's my challenge to everyone who might want to get into the hardware tinkering space. Um, again this was just a really uh simple breakdown of a mini packet kind of included for anyone who's trying to dig into it themselves so I'll let you guys work through this if you're taking on the challenge of building a MIDI controller. So I wanted to talk just briefly about design constraints and how that can help you build interesting things. Um, so this shows up in art space, this shows up in engineering solutions. Like if you have interface boundaries and have design constraints and that, that like forces the shape of your solution into a particular space, and that is critical to find a solution. Like if you don't have those constraints, you can't find a solution. So some examples in this project where that, that showed up, like why are the dimensions of the sculpture 2.1 meters by 0.8 meters? Well, that matches the arc length of those five meter LED strips. So if, if we wanted to have a larger sculpture, we would need longer than five meter LED strips. Um, you know, why do we choose web assembly? Well, because WebAssembly is an established standard, so you, we could easily use an existing um, version of the interpreter on the microcontroller. And then, of course, browsers all have that built in. And so, you know, we could debug and take a look at what it worked in the browser. And I, and I had confidence when we were moving the code that worked in the browser and transitioned to the microcontroller. It was, it was, I knew that it worked 
ahead of time unless there was some problem with the, the particular interpreter there in the microcontroller because it was matching the standard. Um, so, and it's it's so invaluable to have like two reference versions of something where you can you can compare the two and make sure that you understand both are working because you can iterate fast on one and then you get verification on the other. Um, and then you know we've talked a, a couple times about why MIDI input is amazing, but you know it, it gives us interactivity through code and tactile. Um, and um, you know I, I right heavily, here, heavily documented. Yeah, well. heavily, very heavily, important. Yeah, very heavily documented. I mean, I've got two instruments sitting in the room that support it, and I don't know if your little Akai minis in, in your bag, but you know the, the yeah. countless little instruments that you can use, um, and and they all output. The same protocol, and so you're constrained to that protocol. And because we accept the Web Mini API, then we can accept that input. So you know, bring bring in whatever in instrument you have that are interested to see. Like in particular, if anybody has like a like a drum sequence, uh, some type of sequencer or a drum machine where you can app, kind of program using the interface that then outputs MIDI, then you could have a sketch that is taking input from a drum machine and then turn it into output on the sculpture. Um, and so that that constraint of using established protocol allows us to, to to just keep the problem within the space, but also expand what you can do. Yeah. Really quick conclusion: bring your own pattern, create your own patterns. Please try building your own MIDI instrument, or bring any novel MIDI instruments that you have, um, and have fun and experiment. Like. Again, I brought up earlier about examples and looking over coding examples, like a, a beautiful thing in Power Learn how to program on the Commodore was you could just like flip it on and off if it was broken. So with this browser based little mm -hmm. interface, like you can't you can't break the interface in the browser. Like worst case, you just reload the page, but like it's trivial to experiment with. So don't be afraid to try. The IDE is very nice. Yeah. The virtualized so sculpture, I think, will really help a lot. Uh, I know it's helped me a lot as I've been working through building building controllers. So, so, so have have fun. Uh, and we wanted to put in some acknowledgments. Uh, thank you, Strings Loop. Thank you, Alex Miller in particular, and Bridget here as well for uh, giving us this opportunity and supporting us through this. Um, and, um, and thank you to Arch Reactor, which was the makerspace where the form of the sculpture took shape. Please visit the Lemonscape page and yes. uh, it's a Lemonscape page, but also go visit the chat room. We'll be answering questions there. And and if there's questions and you know, if there's if there's things that would assist, uh, we are happy to add that as well. So I know I'll probably be posting progress as I'm working on what I'm working on over the next week.